Welcome brothers, I'm JK Maisie, head coach and founder of the Pawn Reboot System. You can learn more about us by visiting us at elevatedrecovery.org. Now on this YouTube channel, I release four videos a week, every single week. So if you're a man who's struggling with an out of control behavior with pornography or masturbation, go ahead and subscribe and make sure you click on the little bell icon to receive notifications every time that I release a video. Now, a couple of days ago, I spoke about the porn addicted pastor. I did this specifically because I work with a lot of pastors. And I also work with a lot of men who are in vocations that are similar to a pastor, which means that they have a lot of influence, they are charismatic, they are looked up to as a father figure, a mentor, a guide, a coach, so to speak, or somebody who has access to information that other people don't normally have. These men all have similar characteristics. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because you might be a man who aspires to that. You might be an individual who has a talent that might lead you to become a person who can influence others. And also, you might also be a person who has been the victim of one of these individuals and you're trying to gain some sort of understanding. Maybe you weren't a victim, but maybe there was somebody in your life that you found out had a problem like this and you had placed them on a pedestal and you still haven't come to terms with understanding how they became that way. If you're in that situation, particularly if this was your pastor or you were married to the pastor or you were a member of their congregation or their ministry, then I highly recommend watching the video called The Porn Addicted Pastor that I put out a couple of days ago. Today, we're going to be specifically speaking about how pastors and individuals of influence are able to stay charismatic, able to stay focused, able to influence people, and in many cases, become very successful while they're doing this over the years. Because I don't know about you, but when I struggled with my out of control behavior with pornography and masturbation, I suddenly was not charismatic. I did not know how to communicate. I could not focus. I couldn't even study. I was struggling in college because I had no focus. I had a whole bunch of anxiety. So standing up and speaking in front of people was absolutely out of the question. But the interesting thing is many pastors who were struggling with pornography had been struggling with it for a very long time. Yet they succeeded in spite of it. And they were also able to help many people in a genuine way. Why is this? Well, over the past nine years, I've worked with individuals who have these characteristics. These are pastors, these are minor celebrities, these are politicians, these are leaders who run their businesses with their personality. And I found out a few traits which they have. The first trait is, well, it's a cluster of traits. The first one are some narcissistic traits. And these traits involve believing in themselves to a point of delusion, right? And also believing that they are here for a specific purpose, which they are uniquely designed to fulfill. Now, sometimes this masquerades as their calling, right? Sometimes something happened to them and they feel like, okay, like I am destined to do this. This doesn't mean that they have some sort of mental illness. Sometimes it can get complicated and that's not what we're going to get into. All I'm saying is that they have this narcissistic trait and it is not necessarily a negative thing. The second is quite a few of them have some form of obsessive compulsive traits, which means that there are certain things that again, in a positive way, they are able to get done or they are not going to let go of it until it is done almost perfectly. Now on its own, this obsessive compulsive trait doesn't really contribute towards their success or influence. But when it is combined with the third trait, which is a tendency to be very dramatic and exaggerated. And when I say dramatic and exaggerated, I mean the way that they express themselves, especially when maybe they are preaching from the pulpit or they are speaking to others. When you combine that trait with their narcissistic traits, and with their obsessive compulsive traits, you actually create a person who is very influential, who comes across as charismatic, and if they are placed in the right environment, which is usually the ministry, which is a situation where they have to speak a lot, which is being an influencer, which is being in front of a TV screen, which is being an actor, a singer, some sort of celebrity, then they just have the right recipe to be successful. So how does this feed into their out of control behavior? Well, often when a pastor has a very nice, pleasing personality, 
when he is charismatic, when he is successful, he often gains some form of power and status. And when you have power and status and you have a lot of people looking up to you, what that does is gives you a lot of positive validation. And that positive validation is something which, in many cases, gives the pastor or the person of influence a little bit of relief from the shame that they feel. It's kind of like when a man comes into our group, we encourage him to be accountable because when he's accountable, he's putting his shame out there and it actually reduces his shame. So he feels a little bit of relief because he's like, you know what, I'm not alone in this. There are people who are here encouraging me. If that is a two on the level of relief, what a pastor or person of influence will be feeling when he is getting multiple people coming up to him at the end of a service and telling him how great his sermon was, when the couple is speaking to him and telling him how amazing it was, the advice he gave them and the counseling that he gave them and how it helped them so much, for the bigger pastors and bigger persons of influence receiving fan mail, right? People trying to reach out to you, your inbox being flooded with messages from people who adore you, respect you, and look up to you. It's very easy to use all of that positive reinforcement to cover up some of your deeper flaws. In the video a few days ago, I spoke about the porn addicted pastor. I mentioned that some of them become porn addicted pastors because of a past of abuse, a past of abandonment or a past of neglect. And often those who were abandoned, those who were neglected, they get a lot of power and validation by being in that role, right? So you were abandoned. You were neglected by people, you didn't feel important, you spent a lot of time alone, you ended up using pornography, masturbation, or some form of sexual behavior to medicate this loneliness. And suddenly you find yourself in a situation where nobody ignores you, people are fighting to speak to you, to get on your schedule. So you have this sense of importance, and it's something that can, on its own, can become very addictive and you can become quite dependent on it. In some cases, you might even feel that it is a blessing that it is a birthright, that this is the favor that God is bestowing on you because of all the terrible things that you went through. And it doesn't mean that that isn't the case. What I'm saying is that it is very easy to feel that way because your religion encourages that form of thought. And I've seen this not only in pastors, but I've seen this in people who are religious, people who are very spiritual, who feel that, you know what, this is the universe giving back to me. This is God giving back to me for all the things that I went through. You might want to look at it from a different perspective because what this does is that it makes it very challenging for you to admit that you have a problem. You've built this up for years. Your livelihood, your success, even your wife, your kids, your entire identity might have been formed from this. And to face the reality that all of this was created from something which happened in your past or from a series of events or you are using to hide an out of control behavior is a very or rather can be a very devastating realization so that's one of the things that makes it very challenging to work with individuals in this position so how does this grow over the years that still doesn't explain it like how does a pastor how does an individual of influence keep this hidden and how does it get to the point where you know you see on the news like somebody like bill cosby like a well-known pastor news comes out a scandal breaks that they've been abusing people they've been hurting people they've been engaging in all sorts of behavior like how did they get away with it well what i've noticed professionally when i work with these individuals is two things the first thing is trust it's much easier for a pastor or a person of influence to gain trust because of the role that they have. Like your pastor or a priest or some sort of religious leader is seen as somebody who prescribes to the precepts of your religion, which are usually good things. In general, for most religions or any religion worth its salt, it's don't kill, don't lie, don't hurt others, forgive, and so on and so forth. So this is a safe person. This is a person who is, in some cases, on a morally higher ground than you are. So a lot of people trust them and it's very hard to believe that this person is capable of engaging in that sort of behavior. So there's a lot of cognitive dissonance with their congregation, their parishioners, and those who are in their inner circle, even their family members. And of course, for pastors in particular, 
we have the whole idea of this individual being a direct conduit to God. Now, listen, I'm not looking to argue with anyone over the semantics. You get the point, right? There's always going to be somebody who shows up in the comment section and goes like, you are getting it wrong. You do not understand Christianity. Listen, there are so many different denominations. There are many religions. There are many ways that individuals influence people. So again, there's some generalization going on, but I'm assuming that all of us get the point, okay? So don't try to be the perfectionist in the comment section. The second thing that I've noticed is isolation and being alone. This isolation comes from, you know, the saying that it's lonely at the top. And it is lonely at the top. It simply means that as a leader, there are certain decisions you have, there are certain responsibilities you have that come with the position that nobody else can take on that responsibility. Nobody else can make those decisions. And so sometimes as you grow bigger and bigger and you have to make these decisions, it becomes more difficult to relate to other people. This creates a form of isolation. And there's also this tremendous amount of pressure put on you by those who look up to you that you have to be self-sufficient. You have to be this perfect person who is able to overcome everything. After all, that's why we follow you. And one of the dirty secrets of being a person of influence, being a leader, being a pastor who runs a mega church is that your congregation and the people who follow you they don't want to hear maybes. They come to you specifically because they are looking for certainty. If you are a pastor, they are religious and they are faithful because they believe in what is said in that book. And if you are going to be a translator, a conduit, somebody who is called a chosen one, then you better be bringing absolute certainty. That means that really there's no room for you to be imperfect. Now the truth is there is room for you to be imperfect, but you're going to alienate a lot of people and in some cases it could undermine your authority. So this creates a lot of pressure which leads to isolation. And in that isolation is where this out of control behavior grows as well as your shame. And the final reason why this grows and stays a secret for many, many years is basically the fear of repercussions. Now this is a serious thing. The truth is many individuals in these situations don't know who they can really trust. Like first of all, even if they were to reach out to a therapist, if they were to reach out to a coach, if they were to reach out to somebody, who would understand me? Like would they understand? I mean, they know they're a professional, but they're not a famous professional. They're not somebody who has millions and millions of people looking up to them. And a lot of these individuals, the higher they go, the more risky it becomes because there are people out there who are looking to take advantage of you. There are individuals out there who greed is going to take over. So there is that risk. There's also the legal risk, right? The risk of being sued. The risk of somebody claiming that you misled them, right? And they want some form of financial compensation or they want you to pay for the years that you deceive them. This is a very real fear. And unfortunately, there are just not many people that they can speak with, which is interestingly enough, one of the reasons why a lot of these individuals work with me. Because one of the things that Elevated Recovery myself and the Porn Reboot system is known for is our discretion. We understand that you've got a life. We understand that there's a lot of risk. And there's this thing with some therapists, some groups, some counselors, where they believe that in order for you to be truly honest, you must let everybody know about your out of control behavior. That that is the only way to make peace with yourself, by making peace with others. I don't believe that. I believe that you should be honest. I don't believe that you should lie about your out of control behavior. But I also don't believe that you should torpedo your entire career I don't believe that you should unnecessarily cause others more and more pain, especially when you are in a position of influence. Just as you influence many people in a positive way, you can also destroy a lot of hope. And that creates a ripple effect. It doesn't mean like everybody is going to learn a lesson from this or everyone's going to 
understand that we can't put people on the pedestal. No, there are some people who are going to be harmed in a way that might not be fixed in their lifetime. So these are also important things to consider. And the truth is a lot of therapists and counselors and resources out there don't consider those things because they don't find those things important. So because they haven't experienced it, because they don't value any of those things, they do not understand its impact. And again, this is one of the reasons why pastors and individuals of influence keep this to themselves and it grows and grows. So how do pastors and individuals of influence reboot? How do they end or control their behavior and rewire their brains? Well, foundationally, they do it the same way everyone does because they're humans and whatever modality or system they're using is going to work. But there are a few things that need to be adjusted. The first thing is that it's probably not going to work if they are in an environment where discretion is not guaranteed or in an environment where they feel that they are going to experience a lot of shame. In fact, there have been some pastors I worked with who were so far away and we couldn't meet up for one reason or the other, but I knew they needed to be in a group situation. So what they did in many cases is they would actually drive out of state or fly out of state to be in a group, which I recommended, or to be around maybe a state over right across the, <laughs> right across a few county lines or state lines and go to a group where nobody knew them, where there was no chance of them being recognized and get what they really, really needed. That's just an example. But if they're not able to be in that sort of environment, at least in an environment where everybody is the same, most of the people there are individuals of influence and everyone has something to lose. This works really well because it's an environment where you can relate to people, sometimes in a socioeconomic sense, and sometimes just in terms of the role or the vocation that you guys are in. So for instance, some physicians might be comfortable being in a group where there are other physicians, where there are people of a similar social structure or in similar careers where they work with people who put trust in them. The next thing for pastors in particular is that at a certain point in their reboot, they may have to examine their calling right, their purpose for doing this. They may have to examine if this was influenced by some form of abuse, abandonment, and neglect from their past, if it was influenced by certain personality traits, or if it was an actual spiritual event that occurred. In many cases, it is misconstrued, but it doesn't make their contribution any less, and it also doesn't mean that they have to leave the ministry or give up anything. In some cases as well, some of these pastors are going to make the most progress after they've learned how to control their behavior by being in groups where other pastors specifically are going through the same thing. So in many cases, I'll work with a pastor for 90 days or a year till they gain control of their behavior. And then I refer them out to a group that works exclusively with pastors, but works best with them when their behavior is under control. Oftentimes this requires the pastor or the person of influence to take a break from their work because they're experiencing a lot of shame. There's a lot of pressure building up. They can still perform, but now they're more aware of what's happening internally, particularly when they start rebooting it just becomes very apparent and their pain and a lot of emotions start rising to the surface so taking time off to reflect reflect on their calling reflect on their purpose reflect on their history because oftentimes so much has been hidden and also to reflect on the impact because all the things that they've hidden all the things they've done the people that they have hurt in their case it is often magnified you know, we can have clients who can count, you know, on both hands, the people that they've really hurt. But for individuals of influence, leaders, pastors in particular, they may feel that they have hurt many people. And that feeling of sin and shame can run very deep. And it can lead a pastor to a point where he's not sure that he's able to function. In those cases, it's okay 
to take a break. So I feel like I'm actually getting a little too deep into the topic, so I'm going to end it right there. This is how pastors and individuals of influence are able to stay in this situation for so long and some suggestions as to the best approaches to rebooting for them. I'm JK, your brother in the struggle. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. Now, whenever you're ready, there are a couple of ways that I can help you. The first way is to download a copy of my free ebook. It's called Confessions of a Porn Addict, Seven Secrets of Porn Free Men. And it is the roadmap to ending your out of control behavior. There's a link to download it in the description below this podcast episode. The second way is actually to watch my webinar. Now, this is based on the book, but if you're a man who wants to experience results right away, then I go into a lot more detail on this live training. There's a link to join the live training in the description below the video as well. And finally, if you are at a point in your life where you realize that you cannot do this alone, you need to work with somebody or speak to somebody who's seen the movie before, who's worked with hundreds and hundreds of men, who understands your situation and who has been there before, who has been an addict for many years, then you might be a good fit for one of our group coaching programs. Now, the key word is might, because we have certain criteria for the men that we work with. We're really looking for commitment at the end of the day. And also, to be very transparent, we can't work with everyone legally. If you are an individual who is currently on certain types of medication, if you are working with a psychiatrist and some men, not everybody who's working with a therapist, we would need to get a little bit more detail about your situation to find out if you're a good fit for our program. So in that case, go ahead and schedule a call using the link in the description below this video with one of my team members or myself to find out if you're a good fit. And just to make this very clear, my team members are not random people. They are all men who are in control of their sexual behavior and their only job is to find out if our program is going to be in your best interest. And if it isn't, we're not going to leave you feeling rejected or feeling like you had shared your problem with somebody who didn't understand. We all understand that it takes quite a bit to open up about this and we understand what a courageous step this is for you. So please feel free to go ahead and put in that application and speak to somebody. Thank you so much for watching and I'll speak to you later on in the week.